What's up, everybody? Sunday Sessions, episode 21, here to deliver that heat about building a profitable Amazon business. For anybody that doesn't know me, my name is Eric Castellano, and welcome to the Amazon Lit YouTube channel. If you haven't been a part of the team for a little while and you're just joining, I encourage you to check out some of the videos. We've been posting content for multiple years, teaching people just like yourself how to build profitable Amazon businesses, regardless of where you're starting. Our business started in a basement eight years ago, and now here we are, one of the largest FBA sellers in the world. So all it takes is some determination and some discipline and some dedication, and you can achieve this too. See you inside, stay lit. Q&A time, live Q&A time. I'm here to answer your questions and provide as much value as possible. That's the name of the game, right? I'm a value-driven person and Amazon Lit is a value-driven company. So I wanna be as productive as possible during this video and give you as much value as possible. First question, Chia. We got T. Isaiev. Last time you said you pack your goods in bubble bags. Where can I get these bubble bags for cheap? So you could get them on Uline. They're not gonna be cheap on Uline, but I would encourage you to look for local distributors, right? So just Google, you know, poly bags, bubble bags near me, and you'll get a list of local distributors. Start calling them on the phone, ask them their pricing, call like four to five companies, get all their pricing sheets, then compare them against each other. Because if you could save a penny per bubble bag, it might not seem like a lot, but if you're purchasing, you know, 50,000 bubble bags a year or even 5,000 bubble bags a year, it adds up. It adds up in money. So just shop around. You'll find someone local to you within, you know, an hour radius who'll probably even drop them off for you. And I encourage you, whenever you're buying supplies for your FBA business, if this is a long term company for you, a long term business plan for you, buy them in bulk because you're going to need them next month. You're going to need them the following month. You're going to need them in six months. So if it's a product that you use or supply that you use all the time, purchase it in bulk if you have the space to store it, right? Because you don't want to be taking up space that you could be using for inventory for supplies. So if space is a limiting factor in your business, then do not buy them in bulk because you wanna optimize that space for inventory. But if space is not an issue, then absolutely just purchase your supplies in bulk. Oh, I got some exciting news. BGHL 2022 is going down. ASD Las Vegas, I believe the dates are, I had a calendar pulled up. I think it's February 27th to March 2nd are the dates of ASD. SD, and one of those days in there, we'll be doing BGHL Business Growth Hacks Live. This is a live event where Amazon sellers and entrepreneurs, where we fly in speakers from all over the world and they deliver information and we deliver information on how to change this up, right? How to fix your mindset, how to scale your business, how to be a better business owner and better entrepreneur. So I'm super excited about that. So mark it on your calendars, make sure you book your hotels out in Vegas and make sure you register for ASD. I'll be posting stuff about this on my Instagram story in the coming weeks. So if you're not following us on Instagram, make sure you pop over there. Give us a follow, Amazon underscore lit. Can't find any profitable suppliers in New York, New Jersey area. Expand your search. I don't know why you're limiting it to just the New York, New Jersey area. I'm assuming that's where you live and that's definitely a great place to start. But if you're having trouble finding profitable distributors in that area, you just gotta expand your search. There's a whole country out there of suppliers who wanna make money and sell you products. How do you increase resources Restock limits. I feel like this is a question I get asked every time I'm on one of these calls. So increasing restock limits is pretty simple and straightforward. First, you want to be consistent with selling, right? You want to make sure you don't have any SKUs that are just sitting in Amazon, not moving, right? Amazon's looking at your turn rate, right? Your sell-through rate. They're making sure that this seller or that seller is moving inventory. They do not want to be a storage facility. So you want to make sure your inventory is selling. And if it's not selling, drop the price, lose a couple bucks on it, break even, just get rid of it. You want to get rid of that inventory that's just been sitting around, especially if it's been there 60, 90 days. It's not making you any money anyway, just move it out. That's the first step to helping increase your restock limits. Also, you want to make sure that in your shipping plans, you have no shipments that were test shipments or you put them in to figure out what destination it will go to and you never deleted them. So you want to go through your shipping plans and delete any excess shipping plans you have.
have laying around that haven't been sent to Amazon because that's calculated in your ASIN quantity and it's included in your restock limit. The third thing you want to do is manage your stranded inventory. So on Seller Central, there's a tab called Stranded Inventory. You want to go through all of those stranded ASINs and address those issues. Take a couple hours. I encourage you to look at stranded inventory a couple times a week and address them because if you don't, they will build up. You know, for example, right now in our stranded inventory, we address this on a regular basis but I'm pulling it up right now. We have 182 stranded ASINs, right? And some of them have pretty large quantities and we're addressing this pretty consistently as well. You know, we have a few of our top inventory products. We have 373 ASINs stranded of one product, 218, 209, 209, 182, 178. So just in the top 10 stranded SKUs, we have about 2000 ASINs that are stranded there at an average selling price of, you know, 20 bucks a pop, that's $40,000 in Amazon sales revenue that's sitting stranded in our seller central. So I'm sure you have a lot of stranded inventory as well. So that's something you want to address. Also, number four, and the last thing I'll touch on for restock limits is you want to make sure the products that you're sending in are fast selling, good selling SKUs, low BSR SKUs. So let's say you have a bunch of inventory at your warehouse, only send in the ones that you know are going to sell quickly because Amazon wants to make sure that you're moving inventory, moving inventory. And actually I'm going to add one more and and the last one that I'm going to add is make sure that your products across the board are repriced properly, you know, because you want to be consistent with those sales. You want to be consistent. Consistency is key. Amazon's looking at that. So you want to pay attention to your repricing strategies and move inventory quickly. We purchase inventory for approximately three to five weeks, and I encourage you to do the same. This is so excess inventory doesn't build up. And that's how you fix your restock limits. You definitely want to have them closest to maxed out as possible you create a case after you've done all these five or six things i just discussed you create a case with amazon and say hey i'd like to get my restock limits increased for q1 can you please up them to twelve thousand or twenty thousand or whatever you think they should be in order for you to grow so richie resell said how do you deal with the fear of losing your amazon account there's fear in every business right buy a new home fearful the market's going to crash fearful that it's in a flood area it's going to get a crazy storm tornado is going to come through it's going to rip through it you invest in a stock fearful that it's going to go down if you put a put option in you're fearful that it's going to go up so fear is encompassing in all aspects of our life right fear of economic insecurity fear of meeting new people fear of failure fear of success these fears are all part of everyone's lives right and it's important to understand where that fear stems from so for example the fear of getting your account suspended you have fear of financial insecurity right you if you have employees you have fear of letting them down, right? You have fear of not paying your bills. All these fears build up, but you gotta think like, what's the worst that can happen? All right, so my Amazon account gets shut down. I create a POA, I get it back, right? If you're not capable of doing that yourself, there's companies you could hire like ourselves and other companies who could do it for you to eliminate even more of the fear so you know you're in good hands. Also, just operate within the terms of service, right? I've never met one person that reached out to us and said, hey, my account got suspended and they did absolutely nothing wrong. There's always something that they do wrong, right? And usually it's tough to pull it out of them. You know, it's like they were drop shipping or selling inauthentic products or manipulating the shipping weights for FBM. And it takes a little while to pull it out of them, but it's always something. It's always something that they were doing to try to make a little more money. And that's the reason they got suspended. So if you're not operating your business like that and you're being an honest business owner on Amazon, then there's really should be no fear of being suspended. And if you do get suspended you take action and fix it immediately we've been suspended a few times we've gotten our account back every time in less than 72 hours you know and for us missing a day of sales it's like hundred thirty thousand dollars in sales revenue so i get the fear i understand the fear but fear doesn't bring value to your life do I have to finish the course before starting? How long do most people take to complete? So, Lori, I just sent you an Instagram message and I believe I called you Krista in the Instagram message because you're storefront. But no, you do not. I encourage you not to complete the course in order to start taking action on the topics discussed in it, right? The course is designed to be linear. So when we teach you how to source new suppliers, we encourage you while you're watching the video, immediately after watching the video, Video, we encourage you to start sourcing new suppliers, right? When we teach you how to email these suppliers and contact them and, and call them,
them on the phone, we encourage you during or immediately after that video to start doing that. Product research, the same, right? Creating listings, the same. Submitting orders, the same. Requesting discounts, the same. All of it's supposed to be done as you're watching it. It's not like a movie where you watch the whole end or the whole movie and then you talk about it with your friends. It's an action-based course. So when we tell you to do this, you do this. And for people to complete the course, Lori, your your foundation modules will be one through 10. Anything after 10, you shouldn't even be looking at right now because 10 to 18, modules 10 to 18 are the growth modules, right? So that's as your business begins to grow. But the foundation, sourcing suppliers, sourcing products, discounts, finding new distributors, all that, the foundation is in module one through 10. How do you go about removing an IP complaint? So in the email that Amazon sends to you, there's going to be a complainant's email. The first step is to reach out to the complainant and try to remedy the situation with them, right? Whether it's removing your inventory, selling through, guaranteeing you won't list them again, asking them if they can buy back your inventory. But the main goal is to get the IP complaint removed from your account help. So in every IP complaint, there's an email of the complainant. You want to contact that complainant and relay that information to them. Uh, do we train Indian marketplace sellers? Absolutely. So right now we work with about 30 sellers from 13 different countries, Australia, United Kingdom, Italy, Germany, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, Canada. We work with sellers all over the world and we'd love to have some India marketplace sellers in the program as well. So just send me a DM if you wanna move forward with that. So this gentleman said, you told me to expand my search. I did that. And then shipping cost is expensive if a company from Florida ships to New York. So you gotta ask these companies, hey, how how much inventory do I have to order for you to pay for shipping? You know, communicate with them. Is it $5,000? Is it $3,000? Is it $10,000? What size order do I need to place in order for you to pay for shipping instead of me pay for shipping? A lot of these companies will pay for shipping. Like I know for our company, you place an order $10,000 or greater, I'm gonna pay for shipping, you know, because I appreciate your business. So I'm definitely going to allocate the time and the funds to help you out because you're providing business to us. So I think money talks a lot, right? Money speaks volume. So if you're willing to invest, you have no problem getting either negotiated, discounted shipping, whether they pay 50%, you pay 50%, they pay 70%, you pay 30%, they pay 100%, you pay 0%, whatever it is, you'll be able to work something out. Do you guys do any sort of wholesale drop shipping or just FBA? We do not do any drop shipping. I literally, I experience people communicating me nightmares nightmares with their drop shipping accounts whether it's wholesale drop shipping retail drop shipping overseas drop shipping whatever it is their account eventually gets suspended and then they reach out to us and they got you know 40 late shipment complaints and it's a nightmare i advise against drop shipping right for a long-term sustainable business drop shipping is not the model to go with right for some quick profits yeah you can do it but i'm not a, i'm not a quick profit guy i'm a lifelong business guy that's going to build something that's going to generate money for years to come okay this is a great question kate's patel how do you deal with amazon coming on your listing and never going out of stock can't compete with their prices without losing money. So the first thing to recognize is it's not your listing, it's Amazon's listing. So they can do whatever the f they wanna do, right? The second thing is a lot of that process happens in the product research phase, right? Because I'm sure Amazon, this is the first time they jumped on the listing. I'm sure if you looked at the Keepa chart, they sporadically or consistently jump on that listing and it was probably an error in your product research where you overlooked it or didn't see it or didn't pay attention to it. So you went all in on this inventory or half in on this inventory, purchased it, and then all of a sudden Amazon got back in stock. And now you're faced with this decision like, what do I do? Do I sell out? You know, depending on how much inventory they have, we will make a decision to either lock our price in and what it is, hold off. You know, if it's only, let's say they have six weeks of inventory, I can wait six weeks to sell it. But if I need the cash flow back into my business, then I'm going to drop the price, lose a dollar or two on it, match their price, and just sell out my inventory because the cash sitting in Amazon is not making me any money, right? But it's a decision, it's an ASIN to ASIN basis. I can't give you a blanket statement that will cover all situations here because it's all individual cases, right? You gotta look at the ASIN, you gotta look how much stock they have, you gotta look at the keeper chart, you gotta look at the other sellers, you gotta see how much inventory the listing's selling a month, you gotta analyze all that data and then make a decision that's best for your company depending on your, your need for cash flow. 
how long do you hold? I'm guessing this is in response to the listing that Amazon jumped on. So you hold as long as you can, right? As long as you can until you realize that the listing's not gonna go off. Uh, I have a keeper chart, I call it the YOLO keeper chart, right? It's where the seller's just like, fuck it. I only live once, I'm just gonna do this. And the price just keeps tanking, 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 tanking and they're not selling, they're not matching the buy box, it's tanking. And now instead of losing $2 at the top, now you're down $5. And then three weeks later, it's down $6. Then it's down $7. And before you know it, you're losing you know, 60% of your cost of goods because you tried YOLO and you tried hoping instead of using the data to understand that this price is not going up. Sellers are getting more, there's a lot of inventory, price keeps dropping, it's not going up. Just dropping your price initially, only losing a couple dollars, now you're losing half of your inventory cost. So it really comes with time and experience. How many products do you think it is okay to start selling? I think that's the wrong question. I think you should sell what you can make money on. So if that's five products to start, then do that. If that's 25 products to start, then do that. Sell what you can make money on. My car broke down as I was going to buy your course. Decided I'm going to get an old beat up car so I can keep the business going. Listen, I agree with that 100%. Listen, if you're not financially situated where you can go buy a fucking $400 a month payment car, then don't do that shit. Go buy yourself the used car, fucking four to $6,000, drive it to the ground for the next three years and focus on building your business. I couldn't agree with that more, my friend. This brings up a valid point, right? Because I take a lot of phone calls with a lot of Amazon sellers from all over the world. And one of the biggest issues I see is they don't know how to leverage their credit, right? So I'm a firm believer that most people People in this world, they get credit cards and they go out to dinner, right? They go to Applebee's, they go to Ruth Chris Steakhouse, they buy the new Jordans, they buy the new Nikes, they book a trip to Aruba, right? That's not leveraging credit to build wealth. That's living life. And if you're not in a situation to live life, which most people who are doing that are not, then you're losing. You're losing long term. You might be having some great experience, which there's value in that, right? But you're never going to sustain long term wealth by doing that. So what I'm a firm believer in is leveraging credit to build experiences that grow this. So investing in mentorships, investing in masterminds, investing in training, investing in knowledge, investing in literature, right? Things that are going to fix this because most of us, this is broken. Whether it's the way we were raised, the things that our parents taught us, the things we consume on the internet, there's a broken aspect to this. So if it's not fixed by you, it's not gonna get fixed by anybody else, right? Nobody's gonna magically appear when you're sleeping in the middle of the night sprinkle some powder on your forehead and all of a sudden this is going to be fixed. This takes time to fix, right? It's not gonna happen overnight. It could take multiple years to get this aligned with this. And it's super important to do that because I sell some products, right? I, I sell a, a program for a couple thousand dollars. I have some high ticket masterminds for, you know, 15, 25, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars up in the multiple tens of thousands of dollar ranges. And what I find when I get on the phone with some somebody, I instantly can tell when they're talking to me that their this, their mind is broken because they instantly think about the cost of the mastermind instead of looking at the value of the mastermind. It's like, oh, what, $30,000? Like, that's a lot of money. Like, okay, so you put $30,000 in, I will provide you things that will make you 10X that. So you could turn 30 into 300, but they're so focused on the initial 30 that they feel to even recognize the additional 270 that they're gonna make off of that. So it's like this, this is what fucks all of us, right? The other day, this back here, the other day I spent about $60,000 on a mastermind, right? Because I'm a firm believer that you shouldn't invest in a mentor that doesn't have a mentor. And I have a mentor and I am a mentor, right? So I would encourage you if I didn't have a mentor not to invest in me, but I'm a firm believer in mentorship. So I pay for mentorship, right? I pay for masterminds. I pay to surround myself with people who are further advanced in any industry to get their knowledge, just to be in a room with those people and soak up their, their mentality and soak up their ambiance and absorb all the information that they've had because you can't learn that shit in college, right? You're not gonna learn that shit at a gas station when you're waiting in line trying to buy your coffee. Like, you need to go to the places that these people are at and the only way to get to these people in these places 
is to pay for it. Because yeah, you could meet someone on the street and talk to them for five minutes, but imagine spending three days with 50 to 100 entrepreneurs who are making hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Imagine the value that would provide to your life. In order to get a product to fly off the shelves as soon as they get to Amazon, what would you recommend to look for on Keepa? Low BSR, not a lot of competition, competitive sellers. Right? A listing could have 10 sellers on it, but there's only two competitive sellers. There's a big difference between sellers on a listing and competitive sellers. Competitive sellers are usually sellers within a couple percentage points of the buy box price. Also, they match the fulfillment method that you're using. So if you're selling FBM, you're looking at FBM sellers and the pricing that everybody's listed at. If you're FBA, you're looking at FBA sellers and the pricing that everybody's listed at because you could be an FBA seller on a listing, but there's an FBM seller that's $10 cheaper. Most likely that FBM seller, $10 cheaper, is probably gonna win the buy box, especially during this holiday season when Amazon might start allocating FBM buy box over FBA buy box because they're backed up at their fulfillment centers. Also low rank, right? I, I touched on this a couple seconds ago. You wanna make sure the product's low rank, meaning it's selling a lot of inventory. You know, you can't buy a product that's ranked 140,000 in grocery and expect it to fly off the shelves. You also wanna be competitively priced. You have mentioned that looking at your business from an ROI point of view is not good. Please elaborate. Yeah, so ROI, right? I can tell you right now, our average ROI is 44%. I know the number, I just don't use it. And the reason why is because at the end of the year, when you're reviewing your business, you're not gonna look at ROI, right? What, what a CPA does to analyze your profits and your gross profits and your net profits and your margins, they're not looking at ROI. Nobody's looking at ROI when they're analyzing the health of a company. They're looking at net margins and gross margins and understanding the expenses to get the difference between those two. So what we made the mistake of doing was using ROI to purchase products for the first three years we were in business, right? Let's say you got 100% ROI. Sounds great, right? But then you buy a product that costs $1.50. Now you're making $1.50 on it. Doesn't sound so great anymore. So what we do is we use gross profit margins to analyze the products that we purchase. I struggle mentally at times, even with all the knowledge I have, human problems. Absolutely, and we all have them. And, and that's why I just discussed, you know, surrounding yourself by people who've been through the experiences that you want to experience in your life. Because there's no more value, I think, in life than surrounding yourself with someone who's been through what you want to go through or what your trajectory is about to take you through. Because they just have the experience and you can't put a price tag on experience. That's why I had no problem spending $60,000 to join a mentorship, right? And I've spent tens of thousands of dollars on other mentorships and masterminds. And I encourage you guys to do that too and girls to do that too. Stop thinking with your old brain because your old brain is broken I promise you that my old brain is <laughs> if I listen to my old brain I'm not going to make good decisions if you listen to your old brain you're not going to make good decisions you got to fix this this guy said the amount of money we make on Amazon my mentor is Jeff Bezos you know and, and essentially the guy is right he just doesn't know he is and that's okay right it's okay there's two different types of mentors you have right there's the mentor that you pay a large sum of money to be in their masterminds and meet their network and expand your knowledge and grow and learn new things and skills and assets to grow your business grow your financial wealth grow your mindset grow your attitude grow your gratitude grow all that right that's the one type of mentorship right which I encourage all of you have the second type of mentorship, which I use as well, is where I consider people mentors, but they just don't know they're, they're my mentors, right? Because I consistently consume their content on social media, right? I'm reading their books. I'm, I'm listening to their books on Audible on my way to work. I've been learning from them for multiple years, but I've never met them and never communicated with them to let them know like, hey, you've changed my life, right? Because they're usually like uber successful. For example, Jeff Bezos, right? Jeff Bezos doesn't know who the fuck I am. We'll probably never know who the fuck I am, right? But I consider the guy a visionary. So I will take every piece of information that I can from him and use it to my advantage to help grow spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally, and financially. What is a great category for beginners to get started with or beginners when doing wholesale? Uh, I think some great categories are the staple categories, right? Some of the largest categories on Amazon. Grocery, 
health and beauty, personal care. I think really this is what gets a lot of people caught up. They're so focused on the category instead of just trying to find products that they're approved to sell regardless of the category and that they can make money on, you know? So if I had to pick two or three categories, I'd go with grocery and health and beauty, right? Just because those are staples, those make up our largest inventory. Those are what we started selling multiple years ago. That's what kind of got our foot in the game. But I think what kind of screws sellers from even taking initiative is they're so focused on like, listen, I want to sell toys or I want to sell shoes or I want to sell apparel or I want to sell patio and outdoor, I want to sell baby, that they fail to look at all the other millions of products in other categories. I don't talk about advertising costs because it's basically null and void in our company. I can actually, let me see, I got my campaign manager right here. I'll tell you how much money we spent in the past 30 days. Date range, last 30 days. So for a wholesale company, spent $9,000 on advertising in the past 30 days. So I'm gonna do 9,000 divided by, right now we're doing about 4.2 million a month. It's 0.002%. So not even a, a, a percent, not even a half a percent, not even a quarter of a percent of our money is spent on advertising. But what that advertising has generated is $270,000 in sales. So let's just say average profit margin, 20%, right? I'm gonna do some math right here. So 270,000 times 0.2, which is 20%, that's $54,000 in gross profit. Let's just say half of that is net profit divided by two. It's $27,000 back into our company, and we spent 9,000 to obtain that. Sign me up for that all, all day long. All day long, sign me up for that. And that's why I don't talk about advertising, because for Amazon Wholesale, you're selling brand name products that exist already. People trust them already. Crest Toothpaste, Bishop Deodorant, Old Spice. People have been using these products for years. They grew up with them. They're not gonna change their favorite brand of toothpaste. You know, they got the brilliant, bright, white toothpaste from Crest or Oral-B, and that's what they're using. They're not gonna switch it up, and they're gonna come to Amazon and buy it from us, or buy it from you. What's the max best sellers rank you would go in health and beauty? groceries and toys for it to sell. So it varies. I got no problem going all the way up to 300,000 if the profits support it, you know? So I'm a firm believer that if I could find a listing that's ranked 300,000 and I'm making 40 bucks on it, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop the listing price $20, only make 20 bucks on it, but I'm gonna bring that 300,000 BSR down to 120,000 and start selling that inventory. So it really depends on the profit you're making. Like I said, we go up usually in most categories up to like 250, 300,000, depending on the profit is that that item is generating. Yeah, champion, so you asked if I'm getting Gary's V's new book. Yeah, I purchased uh, about 216 or 224 units of it. So I'm getting 224 copies of his book. Do you find it wise to hire a prep center to do your FBA or do you prep yourself in a rented space? I like really prepping myself, but it really what fits your business model better, right? If you want more time back in your life, then leveraging a prep center is probably better, but you gotta account for that cost when you're doing your product research. So, you know, if you're gonna be using a prep center, you wanna add maybe a dollar in expected profits from every item you purchase because that dollar is going to be going to the prep center for prep. I personally like to prep everything myself because I'm a firm believer in quality control. You know, we sell a lot of inventory. We ship about 300,000 orders a month to Amazon customers. And I want to make sure that my inventory is packaged properly. It's shipped safely. It is exactly what we said it was going to be to eliminate any complaints or negative seller feedback in the long run. So it's really a personal preference, right? You could do both. I encourage you to try both. Give both a try and see what happens. Uh, yeah, you get you get forever access to the training videos in the course and they're updated pretty frequently. Actually, in the next two or three months, we're going to be completely redoing the product research module. So the, the ones that are there, they're still gonna be there, but we're gonna create a whole new module for new softwares and new things that we're doing in our company. So it's always updated, it's always changing, and there's a lot of value there, a lot of value. Right now, our students, just the ones we've given our awards, they're doing $9 million a month, right? And that's that's only 80 of the 400 people, 450 people filled out the form. So you figure, let's just say, so 450 minus 80, let's just be conservative and say those other people are doing, let's just say $10,000 a month. So that's another 3.7 million plus nine, 
million. Our, our members are doing about $13 million a month in sales. That's pretty impressive if you ask me. What is the least amount you would spend with a distributor? So if I'm questioning the distributor's authenticity or their products, the least I would, amount I would spend is their minimum order quantity, right? Because usually they decide the least. Not many distributors will let you place a $50 order because it's just too time consuming for them. So the least amount I would spend is the least amount they would allow me to spend. Does that make sense? Well, listen everybody, it's been a lot of fun. I got a ton of shit to do. I love spending my time with you. Like I said at the beginning of this call, my primary goal in life is to provide all of you as much value as possible. When I go to bed at night, I literally lay in bed and I think, what can I do for the community to help them grow their business? Because nothing gets me more excited when I get that Instagram message or I meet someone in person. The other day I was in New York, someone stopped me in the middle of the road, jumped out of their car and gave me a big hug and said, Eric, you changed my life. You know, I never met this person in my life, but just the content and the enthusiasm and the positivity that I share with all of you, because that's the type of person I am, has changed people's lives. And I'm so grateful for that opportunity. I'm gonna to continue to be consistent with that value. So I appreciate all of you being here. Make sure you follow us on the social, subscribe to the channel, catch you on the flip side, have a beautiful day and stay lit.